Osla, your research um, has highlighted the downside of deposit insurance and more generally the problems posed by generous safety nets for banks. What role, if any, did um, deposit guarantees play in making the crisis that began in 2007 worse? Yes, well, in every country, uh, policymakers have financial safety nets to make the financial system more stable, and deposit insurance tends to be an important component of the safety net. And most of the time, the reason for uh, having deposit insurance uh, are uh, multiple. Uh, one, preventing panics. Uh, secondly, hopefully trying to cap uh, implicit commitments that governments tend to provide whenever there's a crisis. Uh, third, uh, giving the government a stronger reason to intervene whenever there are uh, crises. And finally, trying to protect unsophisticated depositors uh, and help small banks uh, be in the business. Now, of course, the, 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 the important question is whether uh, in practice things work that way. Um, unfortunately, uh, our research has shown that deposit insurance also has large costs and one of the, uh, the besides the direct cost that tends to be small which is simply running the deposit insurance system there are indirect costs which are quite large and uh, economists tend to call these moral hazard and the whole idea of moral hazard is once banks know that um, their ability to attract deposits is uh, independent of their riskiness they have a tendency to take on more and more risk which uh, ends up making the financial system even more uh, fragile. Um, so instead of making the financial system stable, deposit insurance systems tend to make financial systems unstable. And um, now our research suggests that there are ways of tempering this. One is if... Um, the explicit deposit insurance is capped so that uh, the coverage is very uh, credibly uh, sort of limited. And secondly, if the, the regulation and the supervision system and the underlying institutions are very strong, there is significant transparency and so on and so forth. So in the case of the recent crisis, we know that neither of those were there. So uh, in my view, uh, clearly that having a deposit insurance system, having implicit and explicit guarantees certainly made the system more fragile and led to uh, a greater crisis. Seems like there might be no kind of a fine balance there because it would it would seem that consumers, people who use banks, investors, would want some sort of guarantee, government guarantee in many cases. Well, um, true. I mean, ostensibly the idea is for small uh, depositors, unsophisticated depositors, uh, to be protected. However. Um, what ends up happening is that through these costly bailouts, it is the large depositors and the creditors that tend to reap the benefits. And at the expense of making the system even more fragile, because in doing so, market discipline is undermined to the extent that it becomes extremely difficult for regulators and supervisors to have effective uh, supervision uh, because the, the incentives to take on uh, risk tend to uh, be very difficult to curb. Now, the World Bank's message on deposit insurance for developing countries uh, used to be that they should be slow to adopt it, especially if the legal and institutional environment was weak. Is that correct? That's certainly correct, yes. And ha has, this, has this changed at all since the crisis where countries with deposit insurance uh, seem to increase their coverage even more? Yes, well, um, there are two parts to the message. One is for um, our research suggests 
that for countries where the underlying institutional setting is poor, uh, you really want to uh, wait before you uh, adopt an explicit deposition system because um, the, uh, the regulations and supervisions are not strong enough to step in and reduce the um, risk-taking behavior. Now, however, if the country has decided to adopt an explicit deposit system, research also suggests uh, certain guidelines to make sure that the system is well designed. And there, one of the most important uh, guidelines, uh, principles to design a, um, a, a well-functioning deposit insurance system is to credibly limit uh, the coverage of deposit insurance so that a, um, there are a, uh, a group of sophisticated creditors, large depositors, interbank depositors, who are inescapably at the risk of loss so that they will have the incentives to uh, vigilantly monitor uh, institutions. And at the same time, of course, they need, to, uh, they need to have enough transparency and good quality information to be able to do that effectively. Now, neither of those messages have really changed. In uh, the past crisis, what we've seen is that uh, certainly uh, everybody was covered and there wasn't enough of a transparency and good quality information for people uh, to, to monitor risk, even if they had the incentives to monitor. So um, I think it was just uh, uh, we ignored what we knew. Going back to um, the, the, the British Northern Rock crisis, some have argued that the, the run on Northern Rock was caused by the fact that uh, British deposit insurance at the time was a coinsurance feature, which exposed depositors to a loss of 10% uh, of their deposits, up to about 35,000 pounds. Wasn't co coinsurance supposed to be a good thing to promote more deposit uh, depositor monitoring, and why didn't this work as expected? Yes, I mean, one of the important features, as I said, is to limit coverage. However, in uh, limiting coverage, you can do that in many different ways. Uh, in order to limit coverage, you don't necessarily need to make each and every uh, sort of depositor a loss bearer. So, for example, you don't necessarily want to expose uh, the smallest unsophisticated depositors uh, to loss. Uh, you may want to design the system so that large Large depositors are not protected. Interbank depositors are not protected because you expect these parties to be able to assess risk and act accordingly. Now, um, coinsurance is a feature that some of the systems have, uh, which may introduce uh, sort of uh, market discipline. But uh, presumably, if a large set of unsophisticated depositors are also at a loss, this could also cause panics. But I want to also under, underline that um, Northern Rock uh, panic was not necessarily one that was caused by the, uh, the co-insurance in the deposit insurance system. It was a result of an unsustainable business model on the part of the bank. Uh, the, um, there was um, illiquid assets that were financed by um, wholesale funding. And when the, uh, the quality of the assets became questionable, be it because of the uh, lack of information or inability to assess those risks and because of external factors, of course, uh, uh, then the, the whole uh, system dried up because wholesale funding also became um, unavailable. So uh, completely independently of the design of the deposit insurance system, this wasn't a business model that one could uh, continue forever. It was bound to, uh, bound to uh, fail at some point. And you, you really don't want to sort of um, blame the symptom as the cause of the, uh, of the event. Well, briefly, how does a co-insurance system differ from uh, an outright uh, government guarantee, a uh, government insurance program? Well, the co-insurance basically uh, can be designed in different ways, but you could say that a certain 
proportion of your deposit is not going to be covered by the government. So if you have, say, a hundred dollars deposit, uh, you're going to only be covered for eighty dollars of it, and you're going to lose twenty dollars in case the bank gets into trouble. So for small depositors, that could be a significant cost. And if you're not able to uh, properly assess risk, you may be prone to pull out your money at the first instance of uh, a, a room. So that's why um, oftentimes uh, when we think about limiting coverage, we start thinking about limiting coverage from the higher end where you expect, for example, interbank depositors to be much better informed. So they're not necessarily going to run unless there is a reason to run. Uh, you want to make sure that very large creditors who have both the incentives and the means to, uh, to monitor risk actually uh, uh, are subject to uh, such loss. So uh, oftentimes deposit insurance features uh, do not necessarily put small depositors at the risk of loss. Learning lessons from the, the crisis, what strategies should countries be adopting to minimize the likelihood that um, that government in the future will will give large guarantees to private banks? Yes, I think, I mean, you sort of uh, hit the uh, nail there. One of the most important um, issues going forward is not only explicit deposit insurance, but is how to deal with too large to fail or too interconnected to fail issue in banking. Um, and as a result of the crisis, uh, we've seen implicit guarantees all over the place. So basically everything was guaranteed uh, on top of explicit deposit insurance. And uh, so one of the biggest uh, challenges of regulation and supervision is going to be how to claw back these guarantees, how to limit too large to fail issues. And I'd like to say something provocative here. As we see a lot of countries having increased explicit deposit insurance systems, I would say that this would be a good time to think about doing away with explicit deposit insurance for uh, particularly the largest institutions, which are already benefiting from large implicit subsidies anyway. Because if you think about it, explicit deposit insurance cannot stop panics. It's the governments that, that end up stepping in to stop panics uh, anyway. So basically having an explicit deposit insurance is undermining market discipline, and that's what it's doing for the most part. So uh, it's one important um, purpose is also so to allow small banks to exist, be able to compete with large banks, and to the extent small banks are important for local communities, that's a worthwhile goal. But if you think about large institutions, deposit insurance or getting rid of deposit insurance may be actually mute in that case because they're already pretty much covered. But it has a very important uh, purpose. If we limit explicit deposit insurance or if we do not allow large institutions beyond a certain size to not to benefit from explicit deposit insurance, that may reduce incentives for them to become so large. Because if you think about um, being covered in a small institution and not being covered beyond a certain size, depositors may be more inclined to put their money in smaller institutions, and this may limit uh, the ability of uh, institutions to become overly large. Well, you put the provocative message out there. What kind of feedback have you, if any, have you gotten from from foreign economists from different countries, from foreign ministers or, or uh, foreign finance ministers, anyone? Well, I've yet to publicize this much, but this is very much in line with a lot of the research that we've done in the past. And I think it's an important component of how to deal with too large to fail or too interconnected to feel, uh, fail going forward. Because uh, the one important issue is how to um, prevent banks from becoming large. Um, it's... And, and, for example, uh, this um, change in the deposit insurance system could be one way to prevent these incentives because um, trying to limit bank size uh, through 
crude interventions like size interventions or activity interventions are difficult to uh, properly design, given that at the end of the day, having large size may also be beneficial for the economy because of diversification benefits and so on and so forth. So it's very important to focus on the incentives to become large. And how do you do that? You try to prevent banks uh, from, um, from, you know, minimize the incentives that give banks uh, the, uh, the goal to become large. And in that respect, if, one way to do it would be to limit the explicit deposit insurance for large institutions. Um, now, another thing that's important is uh, for these institutions to have greater buffers in case they get into trouble, obviously, uh, because um, regardless of uh, the incentives, there are already institutions that are very uh, sort of interlinked, uh, that are very large. So what do you do there? You try to um, sort of make sure they somehow either hold a larger uh, proportion of capital or if capital is costly, uh, you try to come up with uh, contingent capital schemes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, to the extent um, they're more likely to get into trouble, at least they have a larger uh, buffer of capital in order to deal with uh, uh, losses when uh, they're subject to these losses. And, uh, and in case they really get into trouble and they need to be closed down, this is where the whole issue of uh, living wealth comes in, you know, how to deal with uh, sort of very large institution failures. Can you, can you, can you explain a little more broadly that concept of a, a living will? Um, yes, of course. Um, well, one of the things that is very difficult is to sort of close down a large and complex financial institution because they tend to be very complicated in terms of their balance sheet. They try, uh, even if they're not large, some of them tend to be very interconnected. And because that whole, uh, you know, the idea of closing down such an institution is so daunting, uh, uh, regulators tend to immediately decide to bail out these institutions. Uh, unless there is a plan that is preconceived and pre-tested before the crisis, so in a, a non-crisis situation. So the whole idea of a living will is to put the responsibility on the large and interconnected institutions to come up with a certain design and to make them think through how they are going to be able to unwind uh, their um, sort of business in case it is necessary to do so and uh, to uh, to give them both um, the responsibility to try to come up with a plan, to test that plan, to go through that plan, to discuss that plan with the regulators and supervisors. And also it's very important for them to, uh, to get the message that there is a uh, possibility that this, is, this may happen in case they get into trouble because they have taken excessive risks. And... Um, uh, if uh, there is such a plan, of course, uh, in the case of a crisis, it may not be possible to adhere to it completely, but uh, to the extent there is already a plan like that, it may be possible to at least... Um, hope some of these institutions will be uh, failed when they should they deserve to fail. Is there any sort of um, research or study that's been done that had a living will type plan been in place for some of these institutions that it would have made the unwinding of these institutions or the bailing out of these institutions unnecessary? No, I think this is something for future research. Well, Oslo, thank you so much. Lots of good information there, and I know Jerry will uh, will put good use to it, so thanks a lot. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity.